Hello and welcome to today's uh, sociocultural screencast. We are on the 21st century um, and we're going to have a look at how the social and cultural factors we've been looking at for the last few lessons, how they dictate or characteristics of or influence participation in sport and physical activity. So as you can see, uh, we'll be looking at how class, amateurism and professionalism and all of our social and cultural factors down to transport here and how they influence participation and how they've changed. Well, with the second lesson, which will not be in part of this screencast, we'll be looking at the globalisation of 21st century sport, as you can see down here. So it's a really, really interesting time, I think, in terms of um, your learning with regard to the sociocultural area of the course, because now... Finally, we are in a time period where you will be able to create connections. You will be able to resonate with examples from contemporary sport that you have seen on the TV, that you have participated in, education that you have gone through, uh, female role models that you have seen. Okay, so these are really, really, I suppose this should be the point where now you are in a position to have a real understanding of how social and cultural factors dictate people's participation levels in sport. Okay, so let's have a look then. Uh, we'll start off, as always, with social class. So if we go on to here. So what we can have a look at with this one then, um, what we will know. Okay, so it's still a three-class society, but now we have lines that are blurred between classes. Okay, so what that means is it's a real, it's quite easy to move between the classes, whereas in pre-industrial, post-1850, it's very difficult to move between classes. So not that important, really. All you have to know is... How many classes are there and can we give activities that might be linked to that class to start with and we'll have a look at a little bit more detail with regard to people from the lower or working classes. So let's have a look. Very simply then to start. Let's go for upper class. We can just put a nice easy activity here for hunting or polo. Middle class, we could leave our activities as tennis and golf. And then if we look down to here, if we have lower class, we could put activities such as association football uh, or rugby league. They would be examples we could use for that. I've added polo in for the upper class uh, on that one. It would have been something in the 20th century as well. But I just thought that's a nice one to add on if you would like to. Okay, so hopefully people can see those. Um, and, you know, you will be aware now that the, some of these activities that the does start to be um, more, I suppose, mobility or movement between um, activities and classes now because of what we said here. The lines between the classes are now blurred. But these would just be something to put into your notes uh, to start with. Now, if we go from there, what is really, really important now is that we have a dig into um, the differences in participation between what would be considered the lower or working class and then the upper and middle class because it's still going to dictate um, the uh, opportunities to participate. And there's some really good um, figures out, which I'm going to show you in the lesson. But to put that into perspective or to kind of give you a, a snapshot of what the figures are with regard to your socioeconomic status, which is obviously linked to your class, and how often you participate is quite damning. If I was going to sum it up in one sentence, young people from a lower socioeconomic background participate less than people from upper and middle class. I'm sure you can kind of see that and you will kind of, um, that will resonate with people. Um, some people think, you know, that the lower socioeconomic uh, background people will participate more, okay? That they might do in certain activities, but in general participation terms, they participate less. What we have to understand then is why. Why is it that if you have a, a lack of money, um, you're from a lower working class background um, and what is it that stops you from taking part? I'm sure you can start to think of certain things. So we have to be able to give reasons why lower class people uh, participate less than um, upper or middle. So let's get this into our head then. I think a great way to do this is to consider certain sports. Now it doesn't have to be these. I'm just going to give you two sporting examples here. We're going to use rowing and tennis. And I want you to consider as you go down and you start to think, why is it that people from a lower socioeconomic background cannot participate in things such as rowing or tennis? So you might be able to bring examples into this and on occasion I will put examples into this. So if you were going to take part in rowing or, tell, or you wanted to and you were from a low socioeconomic background, what would stop you? Firstly, money or income. So you cannot afford equipment or transport, or maybe membership fees. So if you're in a tennis club, you might not be able to afford the rackets. You might not be able to afford um, a transport to get to the tennis court. If you're from an inner city area, there might be no tennis courts, uh, grass courts by you, for example, and you might not be able to afford the membership fees. That makes sense. On top of that, 
education. Now, if you are somebody from a low socioeconomic background, you are likely to be in an inner city state school. Now, this might mean that they have less access to facilities and coaching, e.g. Um, tennis courts, as I just said there, and also uh, coaching, e.g. specialist tennis coaching. Next one, stereotype sports. So if we go down to here, and I put rowing and tennis as our example, sometimes people are pigeonholed or grouped into activities that are linked to their class. So what it might mean is, you know, if you're from a low socioeconomic background, you might think, well, actually, rowing and tennis is only for people from the upper or middle class. So these sports become stereotyped and they are directly linked to certain social classes. So you can see how that works. Now, if we go down from here, this will directly link on because if we also say that, this means that in sports such as individual sports, particularly I'm talking about here, um, there is a lack of lower class role models in Olympic sports such as rowing. So you're not going to see people from a low socioeconomic background because they might not be able to afford the equipment associated with rowing. Uh, so, you know, th this is obviously going to make it really difficult. So that's one from here. And finally, something called stacking, which kind of sums up the last two, really. Basically, stacking refers to people being grouped or encouraged into a sports that will uh, match their socioeconomic background. So if you are a poor inner city um, young person, that might mean that you are encouraged to go into a sport that does not require much equipment, um, it doesn't require really complex or in-depth or expensive facilities. So it might be something like football or basketball, things that you can do relatively easy. Okay, so if you can see how that would work, stacking is the ability to stack people together um, linked to their social status uh, or socioeconomic status. So you might put an example in here. Um, now this could be, look, for a middle upper class, they might take part in activities such as rowing because they can afford the equipment or tennis because they can afford the equipment. Uh, whereas people might be stacked together into sports such as football or basketball if they are from a lower socioeconomic background. Now, can I just say this? I'm not picking on rowing or tennis here. These were just two that I thought both uh, involved in the Olympics, both individual sports. I just thought both require expensive equipment. So I thought they're just quite nice for you to be able to do it. Now, when we go into the lesson, you'll be looking at a graph that will show the difference in participation between lower socioeconomic backgrounds and high socioeconomic backgrounds. So it's really important that we keep these in our heads and make sure they've got good questions, individual questions uh, within your notes. Okay, let's have a quick look at amateurism and professionalism there. Now, really interestingly, when we go into 21st century Britain, when you are an amateur, take part in sport for amateur reasons or professional reasons, it has no link to class. That's the big, big change now. It is not linked to class. And uh, I suppose people who are amateurs still take part to enjoy. People who are professionals still take part to get paid. Okay, but the key thing here is there is no class distinction. No, no class dictates whether you take part as an amateur or professional. And to put that in perspective, if you're an upper middle class person who went to a private school and you're an Olympic athlete, you still get paid to take part for Team GB. You get paid via UK Sport, which is not important for the screencast, but you will get money for taking part for facilities and equipment. No matter how rich you are, you will still get funded, okay, for specialist coaching, etc. So that is an important thing to say on there. The key bit is at the top there. That's just an example just to show that. So you can see that. Really, really easy to do for that one. Let's move on then. So if we go to our next one, we're going to have a look now at law and order. So our first thing we're looking at, law and order. So something just to say, law and order is very much prevalent in Po, uh, 21st century Britain because we not only have the police force, national governing bodies, we also have government legislation now that ensures that both society and sport has a high level of law and order. So what we have to do in this is we have to say, okay, if we have got the police, national governing bodies, government legislation, we've got organisational bodies uh, that can stop uh, malpractice in, in, in sport, how does that shape characteristics of sport as we know it today, as we are living and playing at the moment? So what we have to be able to do then, the first characteristic that is shaped by improved law and order from these things up here are as follows. Sport is fair or it attempts to be fair. And this can be linked to things in the following way. Organisations are created to prevent um, cheating, I suppose. So we've got an example here linked to performance enhancing drugs. And there is a world organizational body called the World Anti-Doping Association. Uh, 
Association. And that then is responsible for or banning or testing and finding people who are taking performance amounts of drugs, therefore making sport a level playing. Now, we, as you will know from the media, this doesn't always work, but there are systems in place to try and make sport fair. The next way law and order can impact um, sport as we know it today is it can make sport safe. So the way it can make sport safe is as follows. It can, it, if you are a referee uh, in a sport such as rugby, um, you have a duty of care. Okay, so a rugby referee would have a duty of care to keep players safe on the pitch. So what does that mean? I put in here rugby referee being sued for not maintaining safety in the scrum. Okay, so if I said to you on that, so law and order ensures sport is safe. How? Well, duty of care. Okay, so rugby referees as a good example. Um, of ensuring there is a duty of care to the people who are taking part in that sport. Okay, so I put in here, if you wanted another example of how um, sport can be kept safe or people who take part in sport are kept safe, the World Anti-Doping Association is another good example to use because that keeps people safe by banning substances that are harmful to health, i.e. performance-enhancing drugs um, such as anabolic steroids. Okay, so that could be another one I think it's important to have two there and you should make that in your notes. Next one then, next characteristic is equal. So by uh, legislation um, in, in 21st century Britain, sport is supposed to be equal. Okay, so these are quality laws to prevent discrimination, uh, particularly on the basis of gender or race. Now we have loads of things going on at the moment. Uh, we have Black Lives Matter um, and... Uh, I suppose the one I want to use here, a great example linked to gender discrimination was um, the Chelsea Football Club. This is a while ago now, uh, but Chelsea Football Club had a female physio called Eva Canero. Okay, I haven't put a name in here because I think people just get obsessed with the name. Um, but all you need to know, she was a female physio. Anyway, she was sacked um, based upon um, apparently apparent lack of knowledge uh, with regard to a situation that happened in a game. Now, she then sued the club uh, for sexual discrimination because the manager made sexist comments to water as to why she could not treat the players or did not understand she should not treat the players um, due to the basis, uh, due to her gender. Okay, so she sued them successfully and got uh, a payment for that. So if you can see there, sport is more equal um, and there's an example of how it could work. On top of that, we've got sport is now less violent. So um, this is really important. Now, one of the reasons sport can be, uh, I suppose law and order can make sport less violent, is that players now, if you are part of, or you commit a violent act on a sports field, this can be punished by the courts. Okay. So, for example, there was a football player called Duncan Ferguson, and I'll show you a clip of it, uh, who played for Everton. Uh, football club and he headbutted someone on the football pitch uh, put him in hospital and then got put in prison so the police pressed charges for an, a violent incident on the pitch so that's really really important so we can talk about the law can punish violence so sport is less violent because of this uh, because people know if they go over the top they can be put into prison as a result of this um, so I think that is a good one to put in finally there is something called the Court for Arbitration in Sport, or the CAS. Now, this is an organisation, an institution. Uh, it's the highest court of law for sport. And basically, if somebody gets banned from taking part in sport, okay, for example, you are banned due to taking performance-enhancing drugs, you can appeal to the Court for Arbitration of Sport, which will have a look at it and then see if you are able to overturn that appeal. Russia, for example, uh, appealed to the Court for Arbitration of Sport when they were caught uh, with institutionalised state doping, their whole country doping, and um, it can reduce your sentence, for example. So that's what that is for there. Um, I'm going to move on to our next one now. So what we're going to look at now is education. Okay, so what we know uh, is education. We've looked at education and literacy previously. Now we're just looking at education. Education in 21st century Britain was very much present. Okay, so there's three ways you can be educated. State schools, grammar schools and private schools. But ultimately, education is present because it's compulsory. Okay, so it's compulsory to be educated. What we have to be able to do in the exam is you have to explain two things. One, how education can influence participation at state schools. 
Okay, we're going to focus on that. And then the other way we have to be able to do is have a look and understanding of how uh, education can influence participation at private schools. They've already mentioned bits of this when we looked at uh, the socioeconomic stuff under class. So what is it then? Let's start with state schools. Now, you, a majority of people will have gone through state education. Now, if you go through state education, this means that um, you have certain opportunities to participate in sport. Why? How? Let's have a look. First one. Now, PE is a compulsory part of the national curriculum, okay, up to the age of 16. So if we go from here, this means that you get a range of activities. So, for example, football, dance, gymnastics, you could put those in if you want to. So one way that education can increase participation is by PE being compulsory. Give some examples of a range of activities. Second way is it gives you opportunities to have inter-school games or inter-school fixtures, uh, which will increase competition. You might put an example of your school versus a rival school, um, and that then encouraged you to participate in sport. On top of that, you have things such as extracurricular clubs, which means you can go to a lunchtime club or you can go to an after-school club, and this will increase the opportunity to participate. You might write down a extracurricular club you went to at school. On top of that, uh, there are academic academic qualifications um, that you majority of you will have studied at school and how does that increase participation just studying them does not because for example if you did say BTEC uh, at school that might not encourage you to participate as much but if you do something like GCSE PE the academic qualification of GCSE PE requires participation for your final grade OK, so you'll have a percentage that is directly linked to participation. So, of course, that is going to increase your participation. On top of that, um, there are school club links. So schools have direct links to clubs uh, in the local area, which can then encourage you to participate further after you finish school. Now, what is it then? If that's our state education section, what is it that is different between being educated at. So you can see here, if you're at state school, you get opportunities. But what we will be aware of is that if you are at a private school, there is way more opportunity to participate in sport. How? Why? What kind of things do we know? Now, we know about post-1850 uh, public schools or 19th century public schools. A lot of the things are similar, you know. So hopefully you can think of some of those things they had that allowed them to participate. So let's have a look. Firstly, if you are in a private school, in 21st century Britain, you're going to have more time to participate in the curriculum. So rather than two hours a peer, you're going to have multiple hours a week to participate in PE um, in the curriculum. And on top of this, you get more time to participate in the curriculum as well as a wider range of activities. Now, you are not going to be doing fencing at state school. I don't think, at my state school that I went to, I don't think they would have trusted any of us with a knife. Um, so in fact, they're probably trying to stop people having knives. So they would not let it but whereas you're at a private school you would have a wide range of activities fencing uh, archery which you might not get at a state school now on top of that there are specialist coaches for example coaches come in and are specialists they do not maybe teach there but they have come in just to coach for example you might have cricket coaches rugby coaches on top of that you might have specialist facilities at private schools so for example um you know you go past you know, look now at the, some of the private schools where i teach and it the facilities are brilliant cricket nets um you can see um you can see specialist kind of uh, pitches or whatever you have there uh, bowling machines so all these things or facilities you can have equipment here you can have whatever uh, but specialist facilities are huge give an example um of something it might be uh, a rowing lake or something like this and um, they could use on top of that um there are more competitive fixtures if you go to a private school the majority of them offer saturday afternoon sports fixtures okay which is a really really additional way to increase participation on top of that uh, you would have the opportunity often private schools obviously if they're private you have to pay fees to go there fees can be reduced if you are particularly good at sport so for example you might have a sports scholarship which could um, increase for example a cricket scholarship a rugby scholarship um, therefore you reduce your fees therefore it gives you even more opportunity to train and practice okay so there's some examples there on how education can be split the majority of questions will be linked to state education um, you just mentioned this but this will be something just to add on on certain questions which i will show you in the lesson okay so let's move on to the next one um, um, changes status of women. Now, finally, we are in a position where this 
specification objective makes sense, the changing status of women. Women's status did finally change in the 21st century, and this was due to more equality and less gender discrimination. Now, so if there is more equality and less gender discrimination, so what did that mean? Okay, so we need to be able to give four reasons female participation has increased. First one, national campaigns uh, to increase female participation, such as This Girl Can. You might have seen the adverts, which you'll have a look at in the lesson, that really promote female participation. Um, on top of that, we also have um, more success in women's elite sport that we know about. So for example, we've got to put one in here, England netball being the Commonwealth Games champions, okay? So uh, that's a really good one to use as an example of women being successful in sports. So uh, if there's more success in a sport such as netball, that's gonna filter down to more people wanting to take part in it. Now, how would do we know that more women, uh, more women's sports have been successful in elite sport? Well, we know because there are more female sports now in the media. And if there's more female sports in the media, this creates role models. For example, I'll put an old one here, Jessica Ennis, um, the, you know, the poster girl, really, of the 2012 London Olympic Games. And I'll put here a footballer called Karen Carney. Now, people might know her more now because of a role that she takes up now, which we'll look at in a second. So we have more female sports in the media creating role models. Now, on top of that, not only do we have more female sports in the media, we also have more female presenters who are fronting the shows. And these, this will inspire people to take part. For example, a football, a female football presenter, Alex Scott, and I put presenter here because she's just been named as a football focus presenter, uh, which is a big, the first female to ever do a presenting role uh, for a male uh, football show. So that's a really, really good one to use there. On top of that, not only presenters are the people who present the show, they will often talk to people, okay, who will give their opinions on the game. There are also an increased number of female pundits. For example, I've used here Karen Carney as an example. You could use Alex Scott if she's more familiar to you um, as an example of female pundits. Now, Although this is brilliant stuff here that we've got real examples of how, uh, you know, the change in status of women. Now, I should say, you know, there's been a massive media deal at the moment. So we have two things for the, uh, the Women's Super League in football. Uh, we now have Barclays is a sponsor, put loads of money into uh, women's sport. On top of that, the Women's Super League has just got a three year TV contract with Sky Sports, which shows an example. Now we have female uh, football on Sky Sports regularly. OK, so this will have a huge impact in if the media is showing it, more money goes in, which gives more opportunity for the sport to grow. So final thing I wanted to do is just make sure we can give two reasons. If this is all the positives, anyone who is a female who has taken part in sport still knows there is a long way to go with regard to, uh, I suppose, equality with men's sport. So there are still reasons why women don't participate as much, okay? What are they? And they are as follows. There are stereo the, the stereotype, almost a Victorian stereotype that um, sport is unfeminine still persists or still carries on. On top of that, the traditional mother and housewife roles we talked about in both 20th and post 1850 industrial Britain um, can prevent, they still happen, and can prevent women having time to take part. And the final thing is, if you compare female media coverage and role models um, to males, it, th there's no comparison. There are still way more male uh, role models than females, okay, due to their media coverage being way higher. Okay, so going on from there then, um, let's go to our last one, which is uh, 21st century Britain and income time transport. So let's go down to here very, very quickly then. We have to be able to evaluate these. So when we're talking about income, um, what we need to know, what are the positive impacts of income in 21st century Britain? And then can we give some negatives? So from here then, first one. Um, so the first thing, we have more disposable income available. Um, due to certain things such as the minimum wage being introduced. So people now, no matter, you have to have a minimum wage, which gives people who previously might have had a really low wage, a slightly higher wage, which means they have opportunity to, uh, I suppose, have gym memberships, for example. Um, however, there's some things we really need to consider here. There are two key markers in 21st century Britain. 
2008, there was the economic recession, uh, which meant that lots of people lost their jobs and they could not afford to participate. And we are currently going through one of the biggest markers in British history. So the coronavirus pandemic meant that a lot of people, again, lost their jobs, which meant that there's a lack of disposable income to participate in activities, meaning you can't go to gym memberships, you can't have club memberships in certain sports. So this is something very, very real and very, very relevant. On top of that, time. So if we go to time here, let's have a look at this. There is more time to participate for the working class. We have 38, 40-hour working week. Uh, we also have flexi time. We have more annual leave. All these things mean we have more time to participate. But we should also make sure we can evaluate this. So the downside to this is people often work overtime. So it can mean that people um, have a lack of time and they end up becoming money rich and time poor. Final thing then is regard to transport. Now, pretty much every everyone, not, uh, I shouldn't say that word, a high majority of people have, I suppose, access to transport, such as um, cars, for example. So the increased car ownership uh, for working class means that you can travel to sports facilities if you're from that class. On top of that, and I think this is the big one here, cheaper flights mean that people from working class backgrounds can afford to go on family ski trips, okay, for the first time, really. So that's something good to look at there. Finally, the last thing I want to look at, disadvantage. Everybody, whether it's a bus, whether it's a car, whether it's a plane, people are obsessed now with using transport. It can get to the point that people are so obsessed with using transport, they stop walking, and it can actually stop them from exercising full stop. So the final thing, it can lead to a more sedentary lifestyle due to widespread availability of transport, such as the ones I just referred to there. Please make good notes. Uh, thank you very much.